And the same, this was ages, this was more than a decade ago. And the, the question then comes up and yeah, but you know, there's no place for us here. And I remember saying to the kids, but don't you know who you are? Those rappers that you emulate from the United States, from those actors that you see, like your story is just as important as theirs. He felt that the, the descendants of the formerly enslaved would be easier to control and they would be cheaper. And it was right. It's a difficult uh, yeah. to, to call yourself colored is to embrace a really difficult history. That's also how we realized that the making of coloredness and the making of colored identity mm. has been this response to pain. She was going to steal spices from the master's table and she was going to make a food that tasted like home for her because these people would have come from Indonesia. They with were, their spices stolen. Yes, with their right. <laughs> so this is the, the eternal joke of all colonized people is all that colonization for spices and the food is still planned. But... <laughs> Spread the fire. Um, so my name's Tessa Dooms. I am not Caesar Welsh and Portful. Uh, <laughs> and um, I am doing a takeover um, of S SMWX. And we're doing a really special thing today. Um, I have brought with me to my takeover, um, Lindsay Stahl, <laughs> uh, because we have recently written a book, um, a book called Colored, How Classification Became Culture. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this is the first time I'm doing a takeover and hope to do many, many more. Um, but it's a special takeover because it's one where um, I want to introduce to you a conversation that we're hoping to open up to the country. It's Heritage Month, um, you know, in South Africa, and we're always talking about culture. We're always talking about identity um, and, you know, the, the national identity in these kinds of months. But um, for us, the, the national identity is not just this uh, conglomerate. It's not just this one big um, blob. It is made up of our various experiences, our various cultures, our various norms, frameworks, um, thoughts and histories. And so uh, we want to tell you a bit about Coloured, um, our very first book. And so yeah, um, I'm looking forward to the next, uh, however long it is. I love how you can say our very this. first book. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel like there's going to be another. <laughs> I think there's so many stories, you know, whenever you talk to any South African, there's not just the story of my parents and this, this, our stories are intertwined with so much history, right? Because we are living through history at this moment. Like even today, we're living through a tragedy. Um, we're living through a national tragedy. We're living through, there's just, a, it, it's hard to, you know, as much as we, and I'll, and I'll be frank, as much as we, we are celebrating what's happening with us, it's hard to celebrate and we need to hold space for the fact that this comes at a time when our country is in a particularly broken state. Yeah. And so I'm a bit of the, the downer and I will own that. Um, but I think, you know, my, as, as, as much as it comes from such a place of joy that we finally have this book in our hands and, and how incredible it feels to hold this book with the pictures of real people that we know, my family, your family, the people we interview, the people who share their stories. Um, so many of their stories came from a pl place of pain. And I'm starting, I'm starting with the pain, but I think, I think that's how, I think that's apt because that's how this came to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe it's important for us to tell yeah. um, the story of, of how this book started. Um, and that call that I gave you. <laughs> Um, but it, it happened in the moment of the Nathaniel, Nathaniel Julie's um, murder. I'm going murder. to call it a no, murder. No, it was a murder. Um, by the police in Aldo's. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know the full extent of your experience of that, but mm -hmm. um, Nathaniel Julie's dying created a very weird thing for me as somebody who operates mm -hmm. in terms of explaining politics in the yeah. media space. 
because all of a sudden I was being asked things around that time about mm. the outrage in colored communities. Yeah. I mean, Aldous was literally on fire um, at that time. Night and day. And, yeah, Aldous Night was on day. fire. Mm. And the, the emotions were raw um, in mm. Aldous across communities. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter was happening because of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of emotion going on People asking me to explain why colored people were angry mm -hmm. was really difficult. Mm. That is really, I, I found it to be one of the most difficult things because mm. I was like, isn't it obvious? Mm. That, that's all I felt like saying, isn't it obvious? Like mm. the question, why are colored people angry? Um, just, I was just like, isn't it obvious? Um, mm. You're talking about a community mm -hmm. that feels displaced marginalized on a normal day yeah now experiencing a major trauma mm -hmm. i just didn't i didn't understand why people were confused yeah. until the question about hashtag colored lives matter happened mm -hmm. and i'm sure you had a, a similar experience and that's, that. that's when it became real for me so with nathaniel julius i was assigned the story as a journalist as all journalists right we all descended upon the area I, I, I was away, but I came a little bit later. So I had an advantage in that I was away from the circus and I could sit down and I could talk to the family. And so I go and I write up the story that on the face of it, because I write for an international paper, seems like another example of police killing and what this means in poor communities, poor black communities around the world and the commonality of policing. But then this hashtag, because at the time, you know, you've got Black Lives Matter all over the world. But in South Africa, it takes on a different form that people didn't know what to do with. Yeah. And so there were, so I have an editor saying, so Lindsay, the hashtag, so yeah. So yeah, the, so the hashtag is colored lives matter because they had, you know, it was stuck all over. Yeah. Cause, and I think it's important to remember his death and I know that people are working on it, but the manner in which he was killed was that people from the flats, this is the council houses and the flats in Old Aldo's, and they could see each on Main Road. This is Main Road, it's the main artery of Aldo's. And they could see from their windows that he was killed and he was dragged and thrown into the van. Or he was shot and dragged into the van. And so people were living with this trauma and what they had done was they started sticking up and writing and spraying Cullen Lives Matter on that spot where he died. That's what that, and that had to be in the story because that's how they were memorializing this boy. And it's, it's, it's also worth remembering, this is a boy who was non-verbal and it was a boy named Lockies and he danced and you just always remember the people who lose their lives in these moments, these big historic moments. And so, and my editor's like, okay, so, so they're not using the Black Lives Matter hashtag. I said, no, not quite. And now I have to explain it and I have to explain it to Americans for whom the word colored is not to be celebrated, for whom the word colored is a point of shame it is the sign that you saw on bathrooms in this Jim Crow South that said colored drinking holes or, you know, coloreds only. And so they have been trying to get away from it. And here's this group in South Africa where we have these parallel histories and there's a group holding onto this name and they're trying to get away from it. And so then I found yeah. myself explaining. Yeah. And then for me, the question was, where yours was, why are colored people so angry? The question I was getting was, who are these people? And why on earth are they still calling themselves this name? Yeah. And so, and so that's how we. Yeah. And I mean, that, that, that was the, the, the gist of it. Um, so I had yeah. done a 702 interview, mm -hmm. um, late one night, um, about color identity, you know, mm -hmm. off, off the back of yeah. all that was happening in the country. Um, I was also teaching a course on religion actually at the time. Yes. I remember. And part of the course that I taught mm. was about um, the Cape Colony and how religion played a role in the Cape Colony. And mm -hmm. so the story of Kratoa and the way Henry Beck's wife um, used missionary tactics, basically, to get Kratoa as, <laughs> as her <laughs> servant slave to be more part of their family and their a civilization side of, a civilization process. That's it. Okay. Um, and so... After having that conversation mm. with, with Aubrey and 702, the following morning, Kanyezi called me out of the blue and I had never met her, didn't know who she was, <laughs> but I ball, said, hey, don't you, I heard you last night, don't you want to write a book about Calibus? And I said, give me 10 minutes. 
I literally was I was in bed. I said, give me 10 minutes. I called you, had no idea where you were, um, and said, don't you want to write a book? And you went, yeah. <laughs> and then we were writing a book. Um, yeah, and I don't think, I mean, I always say to people, I don't think I would ever have had the courage to ask to write a book. Like... Mm. So, I mean, I'm the non-writer between you and I. <laughs> well, I, I disagree. But what I would say is that I don't think I would have said yes had anyone else asked me. And because, because of your force of personality, um, you know, because at the time, because I hadn't gotten to Aldo's yet, I was still in the Eastern Cape on a, on a break and in between jobs. And, and you called and I was like, Get, and you know, when Tessa calls you, with that forward, like, we should, we should do this thing. <laughs> we are going to do this thing, guys. We are going to do this thing. We're going to, we're going, and, I, and, and so because I know you as a youth organizer and as a friend, you know, every day, and I'll be, you know, because we know each other. So it's from, not just from the fact that we yeah. were both volunteers, but I was volunteer and you're working with Youth Lab. And, but also because, you know, you can throw together a good Sunday lunch. I'm like, yeah, what was it like a Saturday pool party? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I will ask you though, would you have been, <laughs> given the work that you now know what me, that goes into a book, would you do it again? Yes. Good. Yes. I'm so glad to hear yes. that. This has given me the courage yeah. to write. Um, yeah. It gave me the courage to write. Even, um, you know, this, the, yeah. the work that I do um, in a weekly column. Yeah. The courage to write came from this. Yes. Yeah. And I did it with you so I could get courage. Oh. So that I could feel like I have a writer mm. in my life in this process. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I've always been afraid of writing. So um, I have been afraid of voice. And I always say to you, like, you've got such a clear voice. And had it not been for your very clear voice on the other side of the line and that clarity of purpose, we must write this because it's important. Yeah. I don't think that would have. So I'm yeah. grateful. Thank you. So I, I'm also grateful that we, we decided to write the book the way we did. Yeah. Right. Um, so for me... So it was actually a few years before before this. Mm-hmm. Um, two, two other friends, um, Danny and, and Kathleen and I, mm-hmm. had con- I thought of it, had conceived of, mm. you know, writing a book about color identity. Mm. Um, and even at that point, the only thing I could think of was mm. telling stories. It was mm-hmm. I've, I've never had an interest in writing like an academic piece of work about it. And so when this opportunity, it was like a real thing. Mm. Um, I knew I wanted to tell stories. Yeah. I knew that that was the only way we were going to do this. Um, and I, I, I remember as we were conceptualizing what yeah. the stories would be, mm-hmm. what was also clear to me was that it couldn't only be our stories. Yeah. So we were almost too similar in some senses for it only to be our stories. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And I think how we landed on the stories in particular was apart from the fact that we didn't want to write an academic piece. And we knew the power of story was also that we wanted it to be accessible. We wanted people who were not in academia or people who were not in the elite circles and on Twitter to find themselves and to see themselves in this book and to find their stories and to find their familiarity. And so, and so we did. And so we yeah. found we found people who told various we told, we told the story through various yeah. people. So yeah. And and the other thing about who the book is for, um, yes. so I mean, it, it's not that it's not for the, you know, the it's, yes, academic precisely. circles and but the, the the elite bubble. Let's call it the no, elite we'll bubble. Call it the elite bubble because the elite bubble gets to dominate the conversation yeah. for so long, and and they will continue to dominate the conversation because of the structure of our country. Yeah. Um, but what we're hoping, for me is that um, we go beyond the bubble. Yeah. Because that's where the anger was, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's where the... And, I, and, I, and it's not that I don't want the, the bubble. I mean, we're as much part of the bubble as... No, what as we're saying is we want, we want the bubble to buy books, most definitely. Yes. If the bubble can afford more than one book and donate it <laughs> to, to a library in the, the bubble. township, then by all means, bubble. If you are in the bubble <laughs> and you know you are in the bubble and you know who you are... <laughs> Buy the book and donate it to a group or a class who can't buy it. That's that's we were doing the same thing. We invite you to do the same thing because yeah. everybody deserves a book. But I think <laughs> so the, say it. the important thing for me was that yeah. I, we were now going to write a book about stories of colored people. Yeah. 
but I also wanted to write the book for colored people. Yes. That was one of the heels on which I was willing to die. Yeah. Is that I don't know that I've read a book about colored people that was directed at colored people to read, mm -hmm. right? So even when it's colored people writing, we often are writing for others. And so for right? explaining ourselves. Explaining ourselves or explaining history mm -hmm. or, you know. And I want this book and, and what I, my greatest imagination mm -hmm. is that colored young people particularly mm. read this and feel like, number one, it's written in, in, in a way that is for them, yeah. right? Is interesting enough, is fun enough. I hope so. <laughs> I, I think we've laughed a bit oh, yeah. um, so. through, through the book, but it's fun enough and it's yeah. interesting enough um, that they want to engage yeah. with and they want to, but that they see themselves. Yeah that they read, they're reading it and they read about themselves, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so in my interviews, I made sure that I selected young people mm -hmm. to interview mm -hmm. um, because I wanted that particular, that, mm -hmm. that sense of, oh, there's me. I mean, um, there's a picture of um, Tracy's, Tracy Lee Miller's daughter, yes. Lila. And I'm, I'm sad it's not in color because yeah. I know that the picture of her in that yeah. is with her in pink braids. Which, yeah. So I, I, I constantly think it would be so great if it was in color. Yeah. But I just want young colored people to read a book about themselves mm. and feel affirmed and feel seen in a world where even their own community is telling them no one can see you. Yeah. And, and I really just want colored people in general, but colored young people in particular to feel seen and That's recognized so and heard. Because I think I went in the opposite direction. Yes, you did. <laughs> I did. And it was not deliberate. I, for me, it was, I remember talking to a group of kids in Aldo's years ago. And we, it was a career day, you know, and they get, you, they, they get you in and they're like, tell us about your career and tell us what you do. And so, I, you know, I'm doing the usual thing. And the same, this was ages, this was more than a decade ago. And the, the question then comes up and, yeah, but you know, there's no place for us here. And I remember saying to the kids, but don't you know who you are? Those rappers that you emulate from the United States, from those actors that you see, like, your story is just as important as theirs. And for me, and I think that's why I leaned heavily on history, because for me, the question that we often ask is apart from the fact that we are when we, when you do read and, and, and much as and there have been academic pieces written about uh colored experiences but they're written as you said to you know behold the natives on that note let's not forget um to buy the book colored how classification became culture um it will be in all major bookstores across the country from the 8th of september 2023 um you can also find it on amazon and other um, online bookstores, especially people who are international. Um, but let's get the book colored, let's read the book colored and not only talk about the book colored. So it's so, you know, I, it's interesting to hear how deliberate you were about mm -hmm. talking to young people because I know that I was leaning heavily into history and we came from this from very different perspectives. And I suppose I leaned into it in part because of a conversation I had with young people in Aldo's about a decade ago. It was a youth group, a church youth group. Um, and they'd asked us, a couple of us young professionals, you know, to come and talk to young people. Because that's the thing that happened in Aldo's over and over. Like, yeah. please, will you come back and tell those us. Those of us who made it out. Yes, yeah, those of us. At the time, I was still living in Aldo's. I mean, I only left Aldo's in 2018. So I held on for dear life. Uh, <laughs> and we, um, and so I'd gone back. And, and I was talking to the youth group, the same youth group that I had grown up in. Um, I grew up between the Apostolic Faith Mission and the Anglican Church. And so I went to the youth group and talking about, you know, you go through the tropes, you talk about your career, about studying, it's important, stay in school, plan your life. But then this question from the children, and this was back then, at a time that our country was in a far more optimistic place. And they were saying, but there's no place for us here. Like, you know... Um, BE has locked us out. South Africa doesn't care about us. Look at Aldo's. Look at the state of Aldo's. Um, and, and, I, I, and, and there was just like a sense of a lack of confidence, mm. a heartbreaking lack of confidence. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting about, and when you were talking about Heritage Month, also I remember how Heritage Month always brings a sense of anxiety about what are you going to wear for Heritage Month as a colored person, right? right? 
I remember when we dressed up my niece who, at the time for Krish. We did a combination of a puffed sleeve that looked like an Africana dress, but also a Zulu skirt, but also a head wrap as a nod to her Malawian heritage. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was a, a, a mishmash. mishmash. It was a mishmash because we are a mishmash, right? No one for mishmash, but that mishmash is a is a is a history that is the South African history. And so when those children say they didn't see where they fitted into the South African story, that's for me was important was to get was to answer the question. Who are we? Because yeah. any colored person, and, and a lot of walking through the country, our day to day, you stop and you're asked, what are you? I've had someone say to me, so your father's what? And your mother's what? And you're con- and like, you know, and you know, that's sort of, because that's the way South Africans move through the world is our yeah. first point of contact is race. And so for colored people, that answer is not always as simple. Yeah. And so for me to, for me to find out who we were was to go back to how we even how we even got here and was right. to dig through the archives for the very first time I could find the word being used and it was Cecil John Rhodes I might, I, and there, there might be a, an historian out there so difficult yeah. yes <laughs> there might be an historian out there who found something earlier and this is why we all say this is a conversation so if you, if you do know something please do let us know but my first where the first encounter I found was Cecil John Rhodes who was talking about cheap labor at the Cape because he needed labor to go and dig the new diamond fields up in the north and dig and so and it was a different it was like how am I going to differentiate between the people who were the descendants of the formerly enslaved and then the so-called native South Africans because he felt that the, the descendants of the formerly enslaved would be easier to control and they would be cheaper and it was mm. right. It's a difficult uh, yeah. to, to call yourself colored is to embrace a really difficult history. Yeah. But what I like about the book is that while we've not shied away from the pain, is that we have also we've we've embraced the resilience and we've embraced the innovation of colored people. Yeah. We've embraced how you know just it's because it's not. A lot of it is survival, but a lot of it is also just, um, it's, it's the creation of a culture. That's it what is. it was. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think for me, I, I've made a habit now of saying, you know, mm. that we discovered really late in this process mm. that one of the golden threads throughout the book was pay. Yeah. Um, because we had made such an intentional decision to like celebrate the culture. And we really yeah. decided on the chapters around hair and about language and about mm-hmm. music, um, masculinity. We were looking for the culture very yeah. intentionally. Yeah. Um, and then once we had the full first draft, we sat down and had like a cry in a restaurant because we realized, oh, good Lord, we've collected stories of pain. It's been right? a lot of public crying. Yeah. But, but <laughs> yeah. that's also how we realized that the making of coloredness and the making of colored identity mm. has been this response to pain. Mm. It's been this, um, it's either a, a rejection of that pain or an overcoming of that pain or a brushing past the pain or um, a papering over the pain mm. or a, you know, claiming the pain. Yes. But it has been this response to pain that's created these cultural experiences. Mm. And just knowing that that was the through line was difficult. Yeah. What was also difficult for me was the, the matter of fact way that people told these stories of pain. And the reason why we didn't know that there were stories of pain until we were reading it. Mm. Like my father's story about losing his name, besides the yeah. fact that I'd not heard it until he was 79 years old is a story of pain that my father told in a matter of fact I way. remember reading that piece and calling you yeah. like this. This is how this book goes. I mean, like that was it. It's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he just told the story, right? Mm-hmm. We didn't shed a tear. I was shocked. But I even wasn't even processing mm-hmm. how much of a story of pain it was. Mm-hmm. And it was in trying to write my mother's story that I wrote less about. Mm-hmm that I, for the first time, realized how much pain, you know, was there. And I was mm-hmm. like, it's not possible for me to write all this pain in one mm-hmm. story. 
Um, but reading it together, I did make that realization. Mm. And it almost made me value, and I hope it does this as well for our communities. Yeah. It made me value the culture more. Yeah. Um, so I think about um, your, your, your story about the, uh, the Cook sister. Yes. Right? Um, which I'm going to ask you to share. Yeah. But the idea that what we, what, what colored communities have done yeah. is make music Mm-hmm. in order to deal with pain mm-hmm. um, or make culture and make food and make identity and mm-hmm. make love and words and names. The one thing yeah. I regret about this book is not talking enough about colored names. Oh, we did not. Um, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the conjoined names stuff because there's ultimately a way that you know colored people oh, were sure. making it up <laughs> was when we started calling each other Ridgelin. <laughs> and stuff like that, right? Um, oh, did we miss that I don't part? know. <laughs> but it was the making of things in response to pain. And I, I'm so proud of, of us as kind of yeah. people for being as inventive as we've been yeah. in our resilience to make beautiful culture out of pain. Yeah. And so the cook sister, and I'll go to that one, is I have a new appreciation for that wonderful bowl of fried dough. It is just, it it is now a symbol of resilience for me because, of course, you know, cultures all over the world have a version of oil cook and oil cake. But I imagine, and, I, and, and there's no archive, right? So a lot of this is down to imagination. And I remember also one of the pieces, before I, just to a sidetrack, is when you say, I wonder what it must have been like that day before the ships arrived. And when people knew who they were, and when their lives weren't disrupted. Because so much of the colored experience, the colored identity is in response to that disruption. And what makes it hard for colored, coloredness as an ethnicity compared to, let's say for example, Zuluness as an ethnicity or Kosaness as an ethnicity, is that ours is so intertwined with the colonial project that became the South Africa that we have today. The colonial and the slave project. Exactly. And so you can't... The colonial slave apartheid project, like, you know, all of it, mm-hmm. all of these these sort of degrees and, and, and these degrees of oppression and these expressions of oppression that were leveled against us. And so it's hard... It's, it's difficult to, to sit with an identity that was created out of that. But I... In writing this, I decided that our, our identity was created against that. Mm-hmm. And it was created in opposition to it. So, and this is where the cook sister comes in. So the idea is that it came to the, the Cape with the Dutch. And it was served cold and it was an oily cook. And, and then I imagine that at some some the archive gets lost. But at some point, this little warm brown bola starts showing up. And it is spicy, it is served hot, it is rolled in desiccated coconut. It has nutmeg and cinnamon, and depending on whose recipe, sometimes you put in mashed potatoes, some people will dry nar. My mother used to dry, um, for a while, dry nachi peels. Because if you create nachi peels into a cook sister, that just gives it another dimension. And I think of that first enslaved woman who worked in the house of a Dutch settler. And decided that she was done with this bland <laughs> thing <laughs> and that she was going to steal spices from the master's table and she was going to make a food that tasted like home for her because these people would have come from Indonesia. They with were, their spices stolen. <laughs> yes, with their right. So this is the, the eternal joke of all colonized people is all that colonization for spices and the food is still bland. But... <laughs> You know, that's why all yeah. oh, just like you know, just like decades, you know, spice roots. But here we are, and we can barely get salt. Um, but so the point is, they come from Indonesia, they come from I, they come from Madagascar, they come from islands around, and they. But they also come from Mozambique, and they come from Angola, and they come from what was the Gold Coast, because the history of slavery in South Africa. Sometimes, I think. Um, it it what's the word? it prioritizes uh, the Malay expression and what we do then is that we forget people like Peter Clark whose ancestry was black and but enslaved 
and we forget black women like um i think her name was uh maria dalgoa who was a mozambican woman who came and tried to escape slavery i mean heck we forget about everybody in durban in case <laughs> <it happened. laughs> we forget about everybody right and so what i'm hoping we we so i'm hoping that we we remember those people but also we remember that those stories of resilience of this woman this anonymous woman who invented the cook sister who 400 years later would become a symbol of a people who were trying to make a life out of captivity and out of a place of pain and a reclamation which is a big theme for you and i think particularly it's why i love the Kritoa chapter so much was and we we debated about whether do we call ourselves children of Kritoa? do we yeah. where does she where does she sit for you now yeah i mean i think um i come away from the book still not calling my child myself a child of Kritoa mm. because it feels like an infringement <laughs> on people who are coins and yeah. right it also feels like and I, I speak about the ways in which white women um mm. have also tried and like and white africanness has also tried to claim Kritoa you know, as part of lineage and the, the, like that weird discovery of that link between yeah. Dutch women and Kratoa and like that reclamation stuff that's been yeah. happening. Wait, tell us uh, about the link. Tell so, us, yeah, about so, that, that weird reclamation and poor Kratoa. Tell, tell us yeah. about her life, people who don't know about her. So, um, Kratoa is um, a Dutch, uh, uh, a coin girl mm. who becomes the first Dutch slave in Amiens um, Henry Dietrich's home. Mm. And his wife, um, basically tries to civilize her, as we said earlier, um, through, you know, getting her to be an interpreter, but also a religion. And she becomes kind of trapped between two worlds, um, the Dutch colony mm-hmm. world and then mm-hmm. her, her people. Yeah. And, you know, then marries a Danish man who's part of the colony and becomes kind of the First, I, I imagine the first mixed race marriage, <laughs> like the first profile mixed race marriage. <laughs> the first legal mixed race because it was yeah, a lot of legal, yeah, right? right? It was a lot um, of sexual assault. But then ends up uh, yeah. being shunned by both white people and her own people yeah. for that choice, yeah. right? So she she's not legitimate enough mm. to be part of whiteness yeah. in its fullness in the colony. Mm-hmm. Um, but her people feel betrayed by her proximity to whiteness. Mm. And that's kind of the most colored thing ever that we still live with in this mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. And of course, then the question about who her children are. And mm-hmm. so when her husband dies, mm-hmm. the the ways in which she becomes isolated and judged and all of that and dies alone on Robben Island um, is again another story of just how, how messy Mm. you know, life has been made for coloredness. Yeah. But the 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 reclamation of Kratoa mm. for me is a sacrosanct space for San and for San and Koi people particularly. Mm. Just because their erasure has been much harsher mm. than I think anybody else's erasure. Right. So for me as a descendant of Mutswana people and a German ancestor of the war um, I don't want to claim Kritoa, mm-hmm. but I do want to acknowledge Kritoa as part of me yeah. in terms of the colored experience, yeah. right? Um, but I wrote um, Reclaiming Kritoa um, and the chapter about Kritoa really in homage to the communities mm-hmm. I think have been most marginalized mm-hmm. in the making of coloredness. Because while for many of us, mm-hmm who come from the mixed race, you know, making of coloredness. Yeah. They were people who were fully a people in every way that it mattered. And even their personhood was taken in the making of coloredness. Their language was taken in the making of coloredness. And so I I, I think of myself kind of as a cousin of the children of Kratoa. And I, I, I can symbolically see that. But mm-hmm. I do want to give space for that yeah. to exist fully, you know, by itself. But the idea that then, you know, in the reclaiming of Kratoa, people can go, well, because Kratoa was accepted by 
the colony. And because there is this kind of, you know, yeah. Krotoa represents the mixing, um, and Krotoa's children were Dutch. Oh. Therefore, Krotoa then gives legitimacy to Dutch people having this. I was like, oh, no. I'm like, so the leaps that I found in, in kind of, you know, um, yeah, you know, discussions about Krotoa, reclaiming Krotoa from the perspective of Afrikaans whiteness have been very wild. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll leave people to find the chapter and figure out what to make of it. Um, but I do want to, as we kind of land the plane, because we, we are talking about reclamation, yeah. maybe just to talk about the big arguments we make. I mean, people will go and read the stories of music and f- culture and food and all of that. Language. But, yeah. um, I mean, maybe they, we can end up with just with the big arguments. Yeah. Right? So for the first big argument for me, um, is the idea that colorness is um, a, a created cultural identity, yeah. right? And it's a cultural identity that's been created. Mm-hmm. And so the, the claiming of that is important, mm-hmm. right? The recognizing how it's come to be mm-hmm. is important. Yeah. And claiming and knowing where we stand in that. But the reclamation yeah. is more important than just mm-hmm. the acknowledgement of colored identity as this creation. Yeah. And and that's why I tell the story of my father finding his name. Yeah. And the story of the of, of Kritoa and the First Nations people. Mm-hmm. Because for me the 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 point of writing it mm-hmm. had to be that we have to start taking more ownership of our identities as colored people and stop waiting for somebody to legitimize us. But then before you land your plane, I want to just quickly throw a pigeon in the engine and say that in that reclamation, because we're living through a moment now where coloredness as an ethnicity is more possibly, because you know, there've been, there've been ways, but it has been used and manipulated and exploited for political gain. Yeah. In the last, particularly in the last elections, in a very dangerous way. So we knew that, for example, the National Party, when it first, you know, yep. was was very clearly, we are the party of 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 you colored people. In that very smutsian, we are the overseers of uh, of the colored race. You know, we we sort of the custodians, very yeah. paternalistic. And the National Party kept that going, right? And that's why the Western Cape to a large extent voted in that direction and continues to vote in the DA. Yeah because the interests were seen as aligned as that. But then we have a new subset of political parties that are leaning into that reclamation in a very dangerous way. There's a toxicity there in, in, in how that identity is being reclaimed, where instead of, instead, of, instead of you looking at so the colored identity as part of a greater South African identity, what they're doing again is, and it's all, it's almost that what they're doing again is to take the apartheid project and to separate coloredness once again, and then to use the language of not black enough, not white enough to carry, to get votes. And I think that there's something so insidious about, and so, so dangerous about using real frustration using that real and i love when you said use the term social orphans using that sense of orphanhood and instead of instead of doing it in the way where you're you're talking about reclamation empowerment ex- exactly Empower, yeah. so it is not empowerment it is manipulation that's what i'm yeah. gonna call it. i'm gonna call it manipulation how do you feel about it yeah i mean i i'm Again, I'm, I'm glad you raised it because that's another part of the cultural experience that we raise is the politics, yes. right? And I can't wait to have those debates. Those are going to be some of the most fiery debates we're going to have. I, I'm going to wear a conversation. Uh, fist. But, <laughs> like but maybe this is also the, the, a good way to land yeah. what I think is the most important argument we make. I'll see if I and let you And maybe land. the most controversial one. I'll see if I let you land. Let's see. Is that you and I both identify yeah. as both black and colored. Yeah. So um, we say we are politically black and mm-hmm. culturally colored. Yeah. And that part of what we're saying in this book mm-hmm. is that coloredness is not a racial identity. Mm-hmm. It is a cultural identity. It mm-hmm. is an ethnicity. Precisely. A, a range of ethnicities yeah. at that. Yeah. But it is not a racial identity. Yeah. Right. 
And that's part of how I read the question about what the political mm -hmm. moment and the the almost weaponization of colorness yeah. in the political moment. Yeah. Is that the political project mm -hmm. of uh, of reclamation for all oppressed people, yeah. black people of the world, is one that should cause solidarity, not division, right? Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I've always said, or when I came to the realization that I'm politically black, mm -hmm. it was on the back of understanding blackness as a identity that was created by whiteness mm -hmm. to have someone to oppress. Yeah. So you identified as different on the basis of mm -hmm. your phenotype, and now you are black and black means worthy of oppression. Yes. Not worthy of full humanness. It defines your entire identity. And it becomes a, a, a legitimization yeah. of oppression throughout history. Mm -hmm. And so all of us who share that oppression yeah. are black. But if you go to Nigeria, people don't mm -hmm. consider it different to be Nigerian or Igbo yeah. and black yeah. and Nigerian. Those mm -hmm. things are not in competition with each other. Whereas, whereas with us, mm -hmm. especially for the colored experience, yep. being black and being colored has been set yeah. up as opposition to each other because apartheid said so. Yeah, because right? it worked for the apartheid. Government. Because if I'm Zulu in South Africa, I can be Zulu and black without contradiction. Right, no one questions. No one questions. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, that coloredness is how I show up. Yeah. It is the food I eat, it's the language I use, mm -hmm. it's the norms I understand, it's the religion I subscribe to, it's mm -hmm. the way that I cultivate identity. Yeah. Blackness is about my understanding about the political space I hold in the world. Yeah. And those two things are not in com competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that comes through clearly for people in that, and that it opens up that conversation. Yeah. Um, and it's not a view that is shared by all colored people, for sure. It's going to be one of the hot potatoes of the book, mm -hmm. um, for sure. But it's something that I, I believe is part of the political project of this book, yeah. is for us to say, let's talk about our blackness. Yeah. And let's talk about what it means to be in solidarity with other black, oppressed, poor people of the world. Mm -hmm. Because, um, as you rightfully said, I think it was yesterday, um, the thing that separates people who live in Aldo's versus mm -hmm. people who live in Dobsonville Besides a place called Cliptown, yeah, is a road really because That's the it. circumstances are the same. Mm -hmm. But apartheid wanted us to believe that the circumstances were different, right? Even though people who live in Aldo's probably went to a registration office and called themselves Oliphant when they were in Globus, yeah, that could easily have been in Dobsonville. Mm -hmm. And it's the realization of our of the sameness mm -hmm. of our political circumstances, yeah, that I hope we actually are able to have a, a real conversation about. Um, but yeah, that, that's my great takeaway. So what's your mm -hmm. last? That was going to be my takeaway. That is exactly it. It was when I sat down and I wrote through the politics chapter, um, cause I had, you know, I was lucky in that I grew up in a family where the black consciousness movement, A, we had a very strong Zulu matriarch, so we never doubted who we were. And then also the black consciousness movement was often spoken about. And I was lucky in that I was a child in a house full of conscientized students. So there was never a doubt. But then I moved into a world where all of a sudden there was a doubt. And when I look back at it now, perhaps the perhaps the this oversight of the black consciousness movement, particularly for colored people who joined it, was that they, there was no space when you're fighting a system to think about how individual identities fit into that. And so what I'm hoping is, because we are in the, at this precipice in South Africa, where we are rethinking what it means to be South African. And it's not just colored people, because you see an ethnic politics across. showing up across yeah. in every single party. There's, a, there's an ethnic bent showing up and a dangerous and a scary ethnic bent. And so what I'm hoping is that maybe there's an evolution of a black consciousness that involves these identities that make up what it means to be a black South African. And to be colored is to be a black South African. And I am hoping that people will embrace that. Yeah, and I think we can, we really can only hope. Um, but what I'm looking forward to most in yep. the next few weeks of conversation yep. is um, I've made a commitment. I'm not sure I told you about this commitment. Okay. <laughs> no, but. Surprise. But <laughs> in, I mean, that's why I, I um, yeah. 
we've insisted on celebrating colored as the yes. as the hashtag for the book. Um, so my commitment has been that as we show up in these spaces, I yeah. want to demonstrate coloredness to people. Yes. This is an ex- if anything, this is colored one hundred and one. Yeah. An explainer, <laughs> you know. If you don't know, now you know. And every opportunity we get to show the food, to show the music, to show the culture, yeah. I want to use um, as much of our time um, engaging with people to yeah, do that. Exactly. Um, just because it's also been the thing mm. that's raised us in joy. Yes. Um, amidst all of the messy, mm-hmm. um, coloredness is colorful. Yes. Because it's about joy as well. Yeah, it is. So, it's yeah. Just, yeah, it's just. Um, I was gonna say before you just I I've lost my train of thought now, but just the the point of joy around it. I can't remember, but I suppose then that that <laughs> oh yes, the one thing, I think the big the, as I said we were talking about coloredness one oh one, and it comes back to that question of who are you and what are you, and the not black enough, not white enough. Is that I hope that the colored people who read this book will finally know that we are enough as we are. That's all. Cool. Uh, okay, this was fine. Yeah. Thank you, Tessa. <laughs> that was SMWX, the uh, the takeover, okay. um, the current <laughs> version. And um, I'm looking forward to having many more conversations on this platform. But really grateful to be able to introduce um, college to to all of you, and hope that we can have more of these conversations in many different ways. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>